My life had recently been plagued by a persistent bout of rotten luck. <laughs> I'd been traumatized from my last job. The weeks spent unemployed were slipping into months, despite the stacks of applications I'd filled out and every credit card I possessed had been maxed out to its limit. Bitterness. Self-loathing. Poisoned every fiber of my being left me with an inescapable melancholy that I was starting to believe was, was incurable. My latest humiliation had been to dig through my wallet for spare change as a cashier fixed me with a plastered-on smile. An impatient line grew behind me, only to find out that I still didn't have enough money to purchase a meager amount of groceries. I headed to Woodharl Park afterwards, is a local, secluded, sleepy stretch of land to clear my head. The park was empty when I arrived, leaving me free to wander the paths alone and aimlessly. Hunger gnawed away to me like a familiar enemy I could never quite shake. In a final indignity, the previously sunny sky suddenly began to pour rain. I, of course, was not carrying an umbrella. I was so absorbed in my own misery, I barely felt the gentle tug on my jacket sleeve. Looking back, I wish I had kept walking along the park path without so much as glancing downward. I wish I had ignored the soft, silent plea for my attention. I wish, wish I hadn't made the horrible mistake of believing that a hand with a touch so timid and helpless was incapable of holding the power to be terrifying. But instead, I foolishly stopped in my tracks. And ever since that fateful decision, I've not had a single moment of peace. I looked down to see the two children standing at my side, and I immediately felt a jolt of unpleasant surprise. So both stood no higher than my waist, one slightly taller than the other, and both were clad in black raincoats that looked more suited for a sepia-toned photograph than a modern-day child. They each wore matching wide brim hats that drooped atop their small heads and obscured most of their faces, though I could vaguely discern that the taller of the pair was a boy and the shortest a girl. I was unable to see any features above the pallid faces of their swollen cheeks. Their lips were so colorless that it appeared as if they had little more than a white sliver for a mouth. The children's bodies were round without any, any of the cherub softness associated with youth. Whether they looked unnaturally bulbous, and bloated to the point of near grotesqueness. Unbrushed tufts of stringy hair jutted from beneath their hats like tangled straw, dry as a brittle bone, seemingly untouched by so much as a single drop of rain. Hello, I said, forcing myself to sound upbeat. They stared at me in silence. The girl continued to cling to my sleeve. You okay? I asked. By now, I was drenched and eager to head back to my car. Do you need some help? But the pair remained mute. Just, I stood there, awkwardly, unsure of what to do, when the girl suddenly began to grip my arm with a startling strength that made me worry she'd pull me to the ground. Alarms rang loudly through my brain. I felt an immediate urge to extract myself from her unsettling grip and leave them both behind in the rain. Well, I rarely pulled my arm away, somewhat embarrassed for being afraid of how the pair would react. If you don't need anything, I guess, I'll be on my way. She released her hold on me without protest. Neither said a word as I walked away. When I turned around for a final look of parting, I saw that they were still staring at me, though I could only see their eyes. I felt their gaze follow me with an intensity that disturbed me no matter how much distance I put between us. I didn't look back again. I picked up my pace, I dug my keys out of my pocket. The rain fell as cold as ever. I unlocked my car and was thinking about the can of chicken noodle soup I left in my sparse pantry. But I noticed the girl had left behind a stain on my sleeve. As dark as ink and shaped like her tiny little fingers. I wiped at it with my thumb, but the, the mark didn't budge. I sighed and I looked up to nearly stumble backwards in shock when I saw the backseat door open and the girl sitting inside. She removed her hat and was holding it in her hands, 
both of which were clean despite the mark of my jacket. With her head bowed and her knotted hair concealing her face like a curtain. Hey! I tried to keep my tone from betraying how unnerved I was and failed spectacularly. What are you doing in here? She sat as wordlessly as before, tightly squeezing and twisting the brim of her hat with such violence that I was, I was certain she was going to rip it apart. I swallowed my uneasiness. Look, I said as calmly as I could manage. If there's something wrong, I can't help you if you don't tell me what it is. So I reached into my pocket and I pulled up my phone. Maybe it's better if I call the police and you can tell them... My voice trailed off as I watched my phone screen flicker on and off before collapsing into a scramble of pixels and shutting down entirely. I stared agape at my reflection in the black screen as a terrible feeling of dread began to wash over me. When I looked back up, the girl was gone. In her place rested her hat. The hat appeared soaked, every bit as saturated with rain as my own clothes were, but unlike the jacket and jeans that clung to my skin and chilled me to the bone. The hat didn't feel wet when I picked it up with a trembling hand. It was dry to the touch even as I watched beads of rain drip from its brim and onto the car's upholstery. I realized with something between the fascination and horror that the raindrops left behind no traces where they landed, and when I cupped my hand beneath the hat to catch the drops in my palm, I felt nothing but air. Furthermore, the back seat was completely dry. There was no damp footprints, no water spots, nothing at all to indicate that a girl wearing a coat glistening with rain had been sitting there mere seconds ago. I turned to fling the foul thing into the parking lot and gasped out loud when I saw the boy standing just a few feet away. Uh, she, she forgot her hat, I said dimly, my heart thundering madly in my chest. My mind screamed at me to jump into the car to drive off as fast as I could, never come back to Woodharrow Park again. But it was that same fear that left me rooted to the spot, paralyzed and helpless. Even as the boy stepped ever closer towards me. Stop it! I wanted to scream, but my tongue felt too thick to form the words. The boy lifted his hat. A burst of darkness erupted in his eyes, blinding me as a hellish symphony assailed my other senses. I could neither see nor move as I felt insects scuttling behind my eyes and scales slithering inside of my skull. The vile taste of putrid water filled my mouth as the deathly scent of rot filled my nostrils. Final breaths rattled in dying throats, drowning bodies thrashing in water as they sank, screams of agony so shrill that they sounded inhuman. I heard them all and many hideous more. I stood frozen in the terrifying darkness as the rain furiously slashed my flesh like cold blades, unable to weep or let out a, a watery cry for help. And suddenly, I felt someone grab hold of my hand and pull me free from the loathsome trance, just as abruptly as I had been consumed by it. My vision returned and I saw that I was now alone. Even the girl's hat had disappeared. I dove into my car and I sped away from Woodharrow Park. The sky grew clearer with every mile. When I got home, I peeled off my wet clothes and climbed into the shower. I sat there beneath the hot spray, immersing myself in the steam and the warmth. I, I jumped out the instant it turned cold. I dried off. I crawled into my bed, burying myself beneath the blankets as my mind raced with the nightmare I had endured. I wondered if the children, whoever they were, had somehow been drawn to the despair I would felt as I walked through the park. Perhaps my hopelessness and my sorrow had served as a miserable beacon, guiding them towards me and leaving me vulnerable to their presence. There was one thing I knew for certain. It was the girl who had rescued me. I'd known it the second I felt her small hand touch me. I realized now she hadn't climbed into the car to frighten me, she only wanted me to stay with her in the park. Tears slid down my cheeks as I thought of her being forced to forever wander Woodharrow with no one but a boy who carried hell beneath his hat to keep her company. Maybe, maybe she too had visited the park while bearing a sadness as heavy as my own, only to wind up in prison by it.
I slept fitfully. When I awoke the following morning, I discovered that the stain on my coat sleeve had somehow bled onto my arm. I spent two hours trying to wash it off, scoring my flesh until it grew angry and raw, but the mark, the mark refused to be cleansed away. I sat on the floor of my bathroom, gazing down into the imprint of the girl's fingers on my reddened skin. I felt the horrid chill of Woodharrow's rain creep down my spine. That was, that was last week. The mark still remains on my arm, and at night I toss and I turn, and I vividly dream of the park. I told myself repeatedly, I can't go back there, that I was lucky to have made it out alive, maybe not so fortunate again. But I can't stop thinking about the girl. I pity and I fear her in equal measure, and when it rains I look out the window and I wonder if I see her outside waiting for me, clutching her hat, bowing her tangled head. For the thought both saddens and it terrifies me. So I've made a decision, and perhaps I'll live long enough to regret this one too. As soon as I finish posting this, I'm going to grab my car keys and I'm going to drive to Woodharrow Park. I know that I might be walking towards my own doom. I know that the marks on my arm are likely a bad omen. I know that the girl may... Maybe every bit as malevolent as the boy. She may be trying to lure me into a trap of her own. I know that there's a strong chance I'll never be able to come back. I'll never be able to tell you what happened, but I can't keep reliving the same nightmare over and over again. In a way, I never truly left Woodharrow. I mean, my mind wanders its paths even as I hide away in my home. I've got to go now. Wish me luck. Because I have a feeling. I have a feeling it's going to rain. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to wish you a very well. We're getting close to October. <laughs> Are you as excited as I am? Also, thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you're listening on Spotify. The summer is finally coming to an end, and that means we're moving into the fall. And as we get further into the fall, for those of you that live in cooler climates, you'll probably like to have a nice cup of tea. To get a nice cup of tea, my wife sells it. It's at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get a whole bunch of different teas there, including creepy pasta based teas. My personal favorite is the Dark and Stormy Night, which is why you can get a sticker of me on it. And if you do buy that one, you can always ask for that sticker of me doing a little dab. And you get a special dab sticker. Also, I want to give a very big thank you to all of my Patreons over there on Patreon. Because you guys have helped me out quite a bit. Like, not, I get, not even quite a bit. You guys are like, honestly, you guys pulled me out of an incredibly dark place when I first... So I had to look at moving and all of the demon stuff that YouTube does and thank you guys very dearly for all the help that you've given me. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Kraus, Raven Mitz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, also Dotrade, Payne, Nessie, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Suzaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Fay Lockett, Miss Sander, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Once again, thank you all so much to everyone who is in this list of names that I mispronounce, and everyone who's in the description, and everyone who supports me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I can't thank you guys enough for listening, for watching, and I wish you all sweet dreams. Good night, everyone.